football stadium turned holy space as the Pope holds mass for 40,000 of the faithful. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, the pontiff's call to Catholics in this country and around the world. What kind of a society do you want to build? On his pilgrimage of penance, a traditional mass focused on honoring elders leaves some wanting more. For an indigenous person and a priest, this mass was a missed opportunity. And I'm Neil Kirksal. Andrew is away. Revelations in Ottawa tonight that Sport Canada has known for years about allegations against members of the 2018 World Junior Hockey Team. And a prominent former player is speaking out. Well, I would like to see the resignation of the CEO of Hockey Canada. And a Canadian tech darling slashes a thousand jobs. I cried a lot, I cried some more, I called my mom. Shopify's big gamble did not pay off. This is The National. Tonight, we are in Edmonton bearing witness as Pope Francis continues on his pilgrimage of penitence for the evil carried out at residential schools. But on a day when Catholics honor their elders, some say the Pope missed an opportunity to address how church-run schools severed children from the wisdom of their grandparents. He celebrated mass in front of 40,000 people, the grand ritual flooding the senses, and then later some much quieter moments at Lac saint -Anne, named for the woman revered as the grandmother of Jesus. But there were no more words of apology, even as more harsh judgments emerged of what the Pope has said in his quest for forgiveness. Olivia Stefanovic shows us more of his message and why some reject it. A meeting with a multitude of the faithful. A chance for Pope Francis to speak to Catholics directly. about the direction he wants to take. A future in which the history of violence and marginalization suffered by our indigenous brothers and sisters is never repeated. But one day after he delivered an apology for the sins committed by Catholics at residential schools, the Pope's traditional mass, including some Latin, did not address indigenous cultures or traditions. For an indigenous person and a priest, this mass was a missed opportunity of the celebration of indigenous spiritual ways. It just, and tr being transported back into a, a time that I didn't even know as a child. So I don't know what else to say. I, I, I'm just amazed. But the Pope's message did speak to others. He's trying to direct us, I believe, the path forward. People are in different areas of accepting it. So, I mean, I think that's up to residential school survivors. I'm a day school survivor. Still, many want the Pope to back up his words of contrition with concrete actions. What they need to do is to rescind the doctrine of the discovery uh, that really put imposed a lot on our First Nations people. This Canadian Archbishop says the Vatican will release a document to address the doctrine of discovery that justified the seizure of Indigenous land by colonial powers. It would be very good if the Pope could make that even clearer. The bishops of Canada are fully committed to walking together with the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. Canadian Catholic leaders pledged to continue the Pope's work. Some Catholics are also trying to do their part. I noticed your shirt, the Every Child Matters shirt. Why is it important for you to wear that? Yeah, well, I think each of us walks through our own journey through truth and reconciliation. And by wearing my orange shirt today gives me a chance to display my commitment. Residential school survivor Joseph O'Brien. These are my people. I love them. Came all the way from the Yukon to see Pope Francis. There's uh, lots out there that aren't here to hear that apology. He says there's a long way to go to mend relations with the church, but for him, this is a first step. But when you're here and you see him in person, you come full circle. So Olivia, so, so much meaning in a lot of those words. Uh, you know, a, a day after the Pope's apology, 
We keep hearing more from Indigenous leaders. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's right. So we're hearing from the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Marie Sinclair, who released a statement saying there's a big hole in the papal apology. No full acknowledgement of the church's role in running residential schools. He says the Pope continues to blame bad actors as opposed to taking responsibility for the institution that he represents. And Adrian, we're also hearing concerns from survivors who are worried because the Pope did not address sexual abuse. He mentioned physical, but not sexual abuse. And they say they want to address this with Canadian bishops in the coming days at a meeting as the papal visit continues and the Pope heads to Quebec next. All right, Olivia, thank you for everything. You're welcome. So tonight, Pope Francis uh, went to Lac Saint-Anne, west of Edmonton, where primarily Catholic pilgrims have gone for more than 130 years. It's a deeply spiritual place for some First Nations people far, for far longer than that, known by the Nakota Sioux as God's Lake. <laughs> He came to the sound of drums meant to echo the drumming that a Nakota chief heard in a vision, drawing his people here long before the arrival of settlers. The water, you refresh us and sustain our lives. He blessed the water from the lake and then sprinkled some on those seeking that blessing. Lac Saint Anne is named after the mother of Mary, grandmother of Jesus. The pilgrimage marks her feast day, continuing the Pope's message today of the bond shared with elders. Let us return to the sources of life, to God, to our parents, and on this feast day and in the house of St. Anne, to our grandparents, all of whom I greet with great affection. Those who go to Lac St. Anne seek a place of healing. The Pope's visit itself an acknowledgement that there's a lot of healing still to be done. The resilience. So let's bring in CBC's David Perlicha, a Vatican analyst. You've been here with us over the years. When it counts, it counts right now. I, I'm curious uh, what your gut reaction was today at the Mass. I was surprised this morning at the Mass that there wasn't more of an Indigenous uh, component, a more Indigenous conclusion in the music, uh, in the liturgy itself. There were many Indigenous participants, but I think they could have gone further. That surprised me. What didn't was the way Pope Francis uh, encouraged people to reflect on ancestors, history, and the value in that, and yet not get trapped in the past and that's obviously a message to catholics around the world and particularly the elements in the catholic church that are fighting this pope of change and the direction that he is taking the vatican which is towards the marginalized towards the excluded towards as he spoke about this morning the elderly and so let's talk about the vatican for a moment what sort of signals are you getting about how all of this is landing there uh, it, the Vatican is, is in a really interesting situation, and, and speaking tonight at Lac Saint Anne, the, the Pope said something uh, rather interesting, and it's just been tweeted out on the uh, official Pope Francis Twitter account. I'll read it. Uh, As a church, all of us need to be healed from the temptation of choosing to defend the institution rather than seeking the truth. With God's help, let us contribute to the building of a mother church that is pleasing to him. Now, this is an account, the, an official account that doesn't tweet out very often. This is a line taken from this evening. It's uh, obviously something that the, the church wants us to reflect on, and, and we're going to be have to sit back and think about what this means. Lots of people are going to have a lot to say about the meaning of that. They sure are. All right, David Perlich, as always, thank you. Now, a little later, we will speak with a Catholic deacon with a rare perspective. Well, I couldn't believe that I was so close to the Holy Father, for one thing. A spiritual leader of two traditions gets a closer than front row seat to a powerful moment. I will speak with Deacon Rene Nahani. That's coming up. First, though, it is over to Neil Coxell with some of the day's other big stories. Hello, Neil. Hello to you. So much powerful coverage and more to come. Thank you, Adrian. Those stories, though, take us first to Ottawa tonight. More questions are being asked about what steps Hockey Canada took to investigate allegations of sexual assault and what the government knew as federal funding flowed to that organization. Marina von Stackelberg has the latest. The Minister of Sport may be calling on the national governing body of hockey to step up. Hockey Canada, the whole country is watching. But now a parliamentary committee has learned her government department knew about an accusation of sexual assault when it was first investigated four years ago. They could have stopped this. Sport Canada needs to own this as much as Hockey Canada. 
That allegation, a woman says she was sexually assaulted in London, Ontario by eight former hockey players, including some members of the 2018 World Junior Team. Sport Canada officials told the committee they've known since 2018, but they never told the minister's office and they never checked back with Hockey Canada. It is profoundly disturbing to me to see that uh, in a case of a serious, serious sexual assault, that it's unclear what the follow-up was. Also under scrutiny today, the lawyer hired by Hockey Canada four years ago to do an independent investigation. Now back to look into the allegation for them again. Players who do not take part, she says, will be banned from Hockey Canada and named publicly. The goal of the investigation is to uncover the truth. London police too have reopened their investigation into the alleged assault. This says more calls come for an overhaul of the organization, this time from former NHLer and sexual abuse survivor Sheldon Kennedy. I would like to see the resignation of uh, the CEO of Hockey Canada, Scott Smith, the leadership group and the board of directors of Hockey Canada. I think to get real change, to get the culture change that we need, um, we need fresh ideas. Sport Canada was asked why it waited until the spring when the accusations became public to pull its financial support for Hockey Canada. An official says it didn't want sports organizations to avoid looking into accusations within their own ranks over fear that they might lose funding. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. In a separate case, a jury has found former Vancouver Canucks forward Jake Vertanen not guilty of sexual assault. The 25-year-old was charged in January in connection with an incident in a Vancouver hotel room back in 2017. The complainant, who was 18 at the time, testified she repeatedly said no to Vertanen's sexual advances. The hockey player said it was consensual. Nearly all of British Columbia is in the grips of a dangerous heat wave tonight and people are being warned it could be days before there is any relief. In parts of Metro Vancouver today, temperatures soared above 30 degrees. More than 20 communities across the province broke daily high temperature records. And just like last year, the extreme heat is particularly concerning in B.C. as many people do not have air conditioning. Let's bring in Johanna Wagstaff now in North Vancouver. So Johanna, take us through why this heat this time is so dangerous. Yeah, Neil, this still could be a deadly heat wave and that's why officials and forecasters are asking people to take it seriously. It's not just the daytime highs we watch for, it's the overnight lows, it's the humidity, it's the longevity. So we hit 40 humidex values in Vancouver today. The higher that number, the harder for our bodies to cool down. Our overnight temperatures in the high teens, again, not really giving our body a break. And this is going to stick around until uh, the end of the weekend. Take a look at the forecast highs across uh, the southern half of the province. We're still seeing them hit the high 30s, low 40s. A few three-day heat waves a season out here is usual, but this is a long event. And Neil, these are the kind of events we're going to continue to see more of in a warming climate. Last year, it's impossible to forget how difficult and deadly it was. How does this year compare to last? Well, first of all, you know, this is a heat dome. It became a bit of a buzzword last year, but the setup is hot air cooking under a lid. But temperatures will be about 10 degrees cooler than what we hit last year. And that's why we're not seeing that government official uh, heat emergency that was put in place because of the over 600 people that died last year. That being said, again, this is still a dangerous event and we're really just getting started. Johanna Wagstaff in North Vancouver for us. Thanks for this, Johanna, and take care out there. Thank you. There are new details tonight about the suspect in yesterday's deadly shooting in Langley, B.C. Police have released two CCTV images of the suspect, 28-year-old Jordan Daniel Goggin. Investigators allege that over the course of six hours, Goggin shot four people two were killed. Police also say he changed outfits at one point during that attack and that he was driving a white Mazda. Goggin was shot dead by police. They are still trying to determine a motive and urging any witnesses to come forward. Tamara Leach, a key organizer of the protests that occupied downtown Ottawa last winter, has just been released from jail for a second time. Leach was jailed again when an Ontario Justice of the Peace revoked her bail after she was photographed with another convoy organizer. 
Today, a superior court judge found errors in that previous decision and released Leach on bail for a second time. She faces a number of charges, including mischief. A surprise boost to Pierre Polyev's leadership hopes came from his old boss last night. Tom Perry looks at why former Prime Minister Stephen Harper is making his first endorsement and what it means for the Conservative leadership race. Friends, fellow Conservatives, greetings. I haven't talked to you like this in a while, and much has transpired. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper weighing in as his party chooses a new leader. Pierre Poilievre was a strong minister in my government. In the past several years, he's been our party's most vocal and effective critic of the Trudeau Liberals. Backing Pierre Poilievre, who on Twitter called the endorsement a big honor. His main rival, Jean Charest, says Harper made a personal choice, one that other contenders today brushed off. I think the vast majority of Canadians and Conservatives make their own decisions and uh, maybe are intrigued by endorsements, but uh, I think Canadians will make their own mind up. But Harper's word carries weight. He helped forge the modern Conservative Party, led it to victory in 2006, and remains a powerful figure. And I think uh, that is something that Mr. Polyev is very grateful for, because Mr. Harper gives him some credibility in places he hadn't had it from his cuddling of convoyers to his preaching about cryptocurrency. So Stephen Harper's laid the hands on Pierre Polyev, uh, and that probably seals the deal for Mr. Polyev in terms of winning the race. Harper sat out the last two leadership races that elected Aaron O'Toole and Andrew Scheer. So I wonder why he thought in this particular race, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's his dislike, dislike for Mr. Jean Charest, but I wonder why he had to weigh in now in this particular race. I do think if you are a former prime minister, there is a quality where you have to hover above the fray. Stephen Harper is definitely not above the fray. He's right in this fight. And conservative strategists say that gives Pierre Polyev an even better shot at winning the leadership. Winning an election will be a different matter. The conservatives' opponents will be sure to remind Canadians why they voted out Harper and his party. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. Another Indigenous family has come forward now seeking answers. Their loved one died and they were not properly notified. This is the fourth such story to emerge in just two months. As Hillary Bird reports, in this case, the hospital had the man's ID and emergency contact details, but it still took eight days for his family to find out. Sitting in her Yellowknife office last July, Yvette Schrader received an odd message. Someone from the Alberta Medical Examiner's Office was trying to reach her. When she finally got through hours later, she was told the body of her 30-year-old son, Christopher, was ready to be picked up. Schrader didn't even know he was dead. When, when she initially called, she, she started talking about him, and, um, and I just said, where is my son and what's going on? Like, where is he? And she said, has nobody contacted you yet? And I said, no, like, what is going on? Where is he? And she said, she, she was in complete shock. She said, this has never happened to me before. I'm so sorry to tell you that your son passed away. Christopher was brought into the Wetaskiwin Hospital last July. He was in cardiac arrest and died hours later. An autopsy was performed, but the hospital has not released his cause of death. Records show hospital staff knew Christopher's identity and his emergency contact. But no one called. His family wouldn't learn of his death for another eight days. In that time, I had gone on a fishing trip and had fun with my friends, and his dad had celebrated his 50th birthday and had fun with his friends, and all the, all the while we had no idea. No idea that he was actually gone. Alberta Health Services says it can't talk about individual patients for confidentiality reasons but said when there is a patient death, regardless of the nature or cause, Alberta Health Services has standard practices in place for the notification of the next of kin. A year later, Schrader is still waiting to find out how her son died, and she wants answers. But why it took so long for her to find out, she had lost him. Hillary Bird, CBC News, Yellowknife. Donald Trump returned to Washington today for the first time since leaving office. Thank you very much. Wow. As he hints at another run for the White House, some Republicans have another name in mind. I would love to be on the Governor Ron DeSantis train. 
Plus, the Canadian tech giant admits it bet big and got it wrong. Now, a thousand people are out of a job. I cried a lot. Uh, I cried some more. First, though, a residential school survivor shares her journey to hear from the Pope. I wanted to, to hear it with my own ears. What the apology meant to her. The National is back from Edmonton in just two minutes. For many uh, attending the Papal Mass here in Edmonton, it will have been a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Uh, we ask this thing in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord forever and ever. Delivering Holy Communion to those attending, more than 400 priests and more than 50 deacons. Now, right there at the Mass, Deacon Rennie Nahani of St. Paul's Parish in North Vancouver. Nahani is not only a deacon, he's an elder of the Squamish First Nation, a Catholic leader who integrates the symbols and wisdom of both Catholic and Indigenous traditions together. He was steps from the Pope at Mass today, sitting right beside him at one point, pretty rare vantage point for a historic event. Deacon Rennie, I, I know it was not the plan for you to be sitting right beside the Pope even as of that long ago, but you got a last minute call. Yes. What was that like? Pretty exciting. And I think I had a dream that something good would happen. And yesterday I actually found out hmm. that we're going to be decorations beside the Pope. You know what I mean by that? I do. Yes, okay. I got lots of bragging rights now. But for me, I watched uh, the uh, apology at Mascawissis and my eyes started watering, not because it was sad, but because I was joyful. I was thinking of my parents and my two sisters that passed away and never got to hear this. And those, those are called uh, like tears of forgiveness, which means that you feel better and your relationship's better with whoever you're having struggles with. So as you're sitting there today and, and you're looking out at the crowd and you're looking at the Pope, what struck you about what you saw or felt or heard? I think I felt some reconciliation there, judging by the cheering and clapping and things like that. Why that think? Like, why that slight hesitation in your voice? Well, there's always some people that um, may not reach that stage mm -hmm. because reconciliation is a, it's an individual thing. I reconcile, reconciled myself a long time ago and I wish that other people would do the same. Deacon Rennie, we spoke with Father Darold Winkler who um, is indigenous, he, he's a Catholic priest. He was watching the ceremony today and at the end he said, and I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but effectively it was a missed opportunity. That, that he expected more uh, demonstrations of respect and solidarity with Indigenous cultures and more words of apology. Do you see where he's coming from there? Well, sort of, but you know, this is not going to come from the Pope. The, the work has to come from the bishops of Canada and below them the priests. What I expected and what I feel is that the Pope would speak his apology and then invite all Canadians, I believe you mentioned that, to help with uh, reconciliation. It's not just a Native thing, it's, it's all of Canada. You, know, you and I did, did some work in, in March before the delegations went to Rome and what you said at the time to us was, was that culture and language, it was taken from us, we need a demonstration that's coming back. Yes. Are you getting that? Do you yes. feel like you're getting that? Oh, yes. Um, I believe that's coming together. I think language is the big thing. I mean, there's other hurts and struggles, but you have to have language to, to make that a part of your life. You know? And our church was not necessarily doing that part before in our community. And so I started that because I look at all, all the places around the world, Chinese, Filipino, Spanish, they all celebrate the mass in their own culture. And I think, why not us? It's a good spot to end. Deacon Rennie, okay. always great to talk to you. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you.
The Pope's apology yesterday was aimed squarely at residential school survivors. So next, we're going to hear from one of the many who made the journey to hear it all in person. We've just arrived at the venue and it's quite crowded here. Her reflections on what she heard and what still needs to happen. The National is back from Edmonton right after this. The Pope's historic visit to Canada is tapping into some deep stores of emotion that have been carried for decades by the survivors of residential schools. Now, last year, we spoke, showed you three portraits of survival. These are first-hand accounts of brutal abuse and how these former students got through it. In a moment, we'll hear from one of them about the impact of the Pope's apology. But first, another look at their experiences. My name is Clifford Claw. I am from the Tlaitli Tene First Nations. I'm also an elder and a residential school survivor. And I attended the Lejac Indian Residential School located 200 kilometers west of Prince George. My name is Cora Voyager. I'm a survivor of the Holy Angels Residential School in Fort Chipoyan, Alberta. My name is uh, Rose Grace Miller. I am survivor of the Kamloops Indian Residential School in Kamloops. I was five years old when it, I was forcibly taken. I was nine years old when I was uh, taken. I was only eight years old at the time. We were loaded onto a cattle truck in 1949 and brought to the uh, residential school. My two brothers and myself. I was uh, in residential school with my two younger sisters, Lillian and Dorothy. At this school, I experienced emotional, physical, mental, and sexual abuse. And the trauma was so great that I blanked most of my school days at, at Lejack. The violence that we experienced at the hands of the nuns was quite random. So it was like you were walking on eggshells and didn't really know, um, you know, what was going to happen next. And it was uh, horrible to be there. They told us if we didn't pray, the devil would uh, take us to hell and burn us. They said if we didn't pray, the Romans would come and they would drape us and they would burn our eyes and burn our hands and poke out our eyes. Eight years old, you believe whatever you're told. So we'd pray all the harder. When I was uh, in residential school, there was one instance that uh, I experienced where my sister was being beaten by a nun uh, on the other side of a door. And my sister was screaming and crying and I was on the other side of the door trying to get in and trying to, to basically rescue her from uh, a nun who seemed to be quite out of control. It was terrifying to have someone that you love being, uh, being beaten and really not being able to do anything about it. Many times we got knocked to the floor by the nuns and uh, they would call us a whore. We don't even know what a whore is. I was raped there at the Indian school. For me, I, it had followed me through my life. The anger, the fear, the shame. I was so mad and angry and everything. All my life was big negative, negativity. All my posit positive attitudes I buried. My reaction to the news out of Kamloops from last week was of course great sadness and sympathy for the families of those, uh, of those children who never did come back from residential school. But I wasn't surprised by it. I don't for a minute believe that this is the only one uh, in Canada. I as a survivor expected this, but what really shocked me was uh, I thought it'd be 10 or 20, but when they said 215, you expected to find that somewhere else but in Canada. That was mind-boggling. 
we knew that there was missing children. We knew there was children that uh, were buried on the hillside there and probably on the school. We knew there was uh, people burned in an incinerator just below our rec room. It could have very easily have been me or one of my sisters. It could have been my brothers, it could have been me. Couldn't have ran away. I could have drowned in a river. I was only eight years old. I want non-Indigenous people to know that there is a very dark history in Canada and that people have to be understanding and they have to be compassionate. I want the non-Indigenous people to know that uh, how painful it was and how the colonization hurt us so badly, how it's still hurting us with the racism. I want the non-Indigenous people to understand they must know, they must learn more about the schools. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why I'm doing this, to educate the public about what happened in the residential schools and how I went through about 20 years of my life to where I am today. They need to understand and stand beside us. It's not their fault. I'm not bringing this up to blame anybody, but I want the history be known. Now, as you just heard, Cora Voyager was taken at the age of nine to a residential school here in Alberta, along with her younger sisters. So how did she receive the Pope's apology? So we've just arrived at the venue and it's quite crowded here. They have elders in the center and also have survivors in the center as well. My sister and I traveled to Muscogee's to see the Pope's apology. In many regards, I am happy with what I heard. In the face of this deplorable evil, the church kneels before God and implores his forgiveness for the sins of her children. I myself wish to reaffirm this with shame and unambiguously. I humbly beg forgiveness for the evil committed by so many Christians against the indigenous peoples. It was important for me to go to see the Pope apologize. First of all, because I wanted to hear it with my own ears and to be there and to witness this apology. And I'm glad I went because I felt that this was validation of what we as Indigenous people have said all along, that there were grievous harms perpetrated against us. However, there were some aspects that I thought were left out. For example, the Pope did not mention the sexual abuse that was suffered by the children in residential schools. And this was a very big part of the experience and part of what was expected um, as part of this apology. But I am deeply sorry. Sorry for the ways in which, regrettably, many Christians supported the colonizing mentality of the powers that oppressed the indigenous peoples. I am sorry. I'm somewhat satisfied with the uh, apology. However, there are other things that I would like to see. I would like to see access to records and also would like to see the Doctrine of Discovery as well as the Papal Bulls uh, rescinded. I feel relieved that I went. I'm happy that I went with my sister, that we were able to share this uh, experience. And I'm also happy that there were other residential school survivors there and that this was a collective turning of the page for many of us. Now, a lot of this, obviously, really hard to hear, really hard to confront. So for anyone affected by residential schools and in need of support, yes, there is a 24-hour line you can call. So grab this number. It is 1-866-925-4419. So that is only the first leg of the Pope's visit. Tomorrow he travels east 
to Quebec City. And when he does, Andrew will be there to bring you the National tomorrow night. And then on Thursday morning, the Pope will hold Holy Mass at the National Shrine of Saint Anne de Beaupré. Andrew will also host that special coverage starting at 9 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and CBC Jam. So that is it for us tonight here in Edmonton. Now it's back to Neil Coxall in Toronto. Thanks so much, Adrian. And there are layoffs to tell you about tonight at a big Canadian tech company. I cried a lot. Uh, I cried some more. I called my mom. I called my partner. Uh, I told my friends. I cried some more. <laughs> the sudden job cuts at Shopify after the CEO admits he made a tactical error. Plus. Can you sing us a couple more, Johnny? Okay. Okay. I'll do this one. <laughs> Okay, a surprise performance from a Canadian music legend, the moment Joni Mitchell fans will not forget. Welcome back. Bad news today from Canadian tech company Shopify, slashing about 10% of its staff. That means a 1,000 workers are out of a job. The CEO says he took a gamble, thinking the online shopping boom fueled by the pandemic would last. Anis Sedari now with who is affected by this sudden corporate correction. Around the world, people who work at Canadian e-commerce giant Shopify started their day with a jolt. Woke up this morning, took a shower, got out of the shower at 8.45 and noticed two emails. One of those emails said 10% of Shopify's workforce would be laid off. The other said Josh Waldman was losing the job he just started. I cried a lot. Uh, I cried some more. I called my mom. I called my partner. Uh, I told my friends. I cried some more. <laughs> and now I'm like part angry and part ready to have a job. Shopify CEO Toby Lutka says he made a bet that the company would keep growing as quickly as it did when COVID first hit. But that pace didn't keep up. The Shopify executive admitting in writing he got it wrong. Shopify might not be growing as fast as he hoped, but at this toy store in Toronto, it's been critical since the pandemic started. Everyone I know who has a retail business um, started with Shopify in the last two years. Sam Kerr uses Shopify for sales online and in store. And while the company does take a cut. Going online saved my business. And now I feel pretty confident that, you know, I I'm, I'm there now. But experts point out Shopify overestimated what would come next. People extrapolated their very rapid growth into the future and said, look, if they're doing $2 billion a year now and they're growing at 300% a year, they'll be doing $8 billion and then $40 billion and then $100 billion. And the next thing you know, they're going to rival Amazon. Shopify stock is now closer to its 2019 price, a big drop from its peak when it was bigger than the banks. While Shopify is smaller today, it's not collapsing, though experts have lowered their expectations for the company, with earnings results coming out on Wednesday. Anis Hidari, CBC News, Toronto. A familiar face is back in Washington with some familiar and false claims. And I won a second time, did much better the second time. Donald Trump was back for the first time since he left office with a hint that he will run again. Why some say, though, there are new signs that could be a challenge. Next. Welcome back. Russia says it plans to pull out of the International Space Station after 2024, putting an end to two decades of cooperation. And uh, the hatch now opening to the uh, Soyuz MS-01 spacecraft. Russia says it will focus instead on building its own orbiting station. U.S. officials say they have not been officially notified yet, but call the announcement an unfortunate development and say they are exploring options to mitigate its impact. NASA and its partners had hoped to continue operating the ISS until 2030. The Washington Post is reporting tonight that the U.S. Justice Department is investigating Donald Trump in its criminal probe into the efforts to overturn the 2020 election. The news comes as the former president returned to Washington for the first time since leaving office, hinting at a 2024 run. But from investigations to a dip in popularity, Katie Simpson shows us the challenges he's facing. 
Donald Trump played his greatest hits, unleashing a familiar pattern of attacks. He targeted transgender athletes, proposed executing drug dealers, and repeated the lie the 2020 election was stolen. And I won a second time, did much better the second time. Trump was supposed to use this moment, his first visit to D.C. since leaving office, to deliver a policy-focused speech, part of the lead-up to a possible run for the presidency, positioning the former president as a tough-on-crime leader. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. A complicated argument for him, given the investigations into his efforts to overturn the vote and the January 6th attack. We will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. All of this may be affecting Trump's popularity among Republicans. That support has just fallen below 50 percent for the first time ever. And there are other candidates, namely the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, who seems to be gaining with every survey. We've accomplished an awful lot in the state of Florida. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis first gained national attention for his opposition to COVID lockdowns. He is very popular among young conservatives gathering in D.C. this week. I would love to be on the Governor Ron DeSantis train. I really would, and I have a lot of respect for him. I just think he has a great thought and outlook on energy production and other social issues. That no one we society. spoke with is against Trump running again, but they're concerned he can't win a general election. I would like someone less extreme. Well, he's definitely lost you know, a lot of people who are traditionally conservative. Trump is worried about DeSantis. He lashed out at Fox News because the morning show hosts talked about the governor's strong polling numbers. But Trump may need to be more concerned about what's happening at the Department of Justice. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Canadian music royalty made a triumphant return to the stage this weekend. Kick ass, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> Joni Mitchell's surprise concert and why there was not a dry eye in that house. Paradise, put up a parking lot. Joni Mitchell, once again, as ever really, has our attention. The Canadian music legend stunned the crowd at the Newport Folk Festival in Rhode Island this weekend. People were prepared to see Brandi Carlisle, but got trademark Joni too. It was her first full set in decades. An unforgettable show for fans. And tonight, it's our moment. Can you sing us a couple more, Joni? Okay. Okay. I'll do this one. <laughs> the overwhelming majority of people were in complete shock when, when she came out. I mean, you look around and people are like, you know, holding hands to their faces and like wide eyes. And yeah, it was unbelievable. Rose and flows of angel hair. It was one of the most astounding musical things I've seen. She just glowed up there. She performs um, Both Sides Now, which just had everybody in tears. It was absolutely mind-blowing. I was actually quite stunned, and I, um, I'm i still stunned. And she picks up this guitar and plays it, and it was like, what? Like, how could you possibly, you know, play it like that? It was the most exciting and meaningful live music moment of my life. I will never forget it. It's the most beautiful, perfect performance. Everybody's crying at the end of it. You just hear her laughing in that Joni kind of laugh. <laughs> Watching it from here is so moving. Can you imagine being in that crowd when Brandi Carlisle touches her heart? I think we all feel that way. That is the national for you for this July 26th. I'm Neil Kirksal. Good night.